Welcome back to Ramdas here and now. This is Raghu, your host. And uh, I want to just say a couple of things before we talk about the episode c- coming up with Ramdas. Uh, we have a retreat that's a fantastic retreat in Ojai, California, at Hanuman Gardens, this absolutely wonderful private spot. Uh, that Hari and Lakshmi graciously host uh, a couple of times a year. It's the Ramdas immersion, and Ramdas gets Skyped in, and and we have really special uh, teachers lined up in April. It's April 4th through 7th. You just go to ramdas.org slash events, and you'll see the whole deal in terms of uh, all of the activities and the sessions. But Jai Utah. Is going to be doing the kirtan. He's going to be also doing a wonderful kirtan workshop. So people who are interested in learning more about how to do that practice, this is a great opportunity. And Dharma Talks in the morning uh, with Ram Das's special media that we select is uh, Ramdev, Dale Borglum. And Dale is, was with us back in the day in India with uh, Neem Karoli Baba and uh, has, uh, is a, a tremendous meditation teacher and has been involved in the Living Dying Project for many years, worked with Ram Das in transitional work, uh, is a, just an extraordinary teacher. Uh, and Davey Hale will be doing the yoga in the morning. And there'll be workshops and special stuff. So go to ramdas.org slash events and look up the spring Ramdas Immersion Retreat, April 4th through 7th. There is still some spots. It's uh, not a lot because uh, we can't get more than like 100 people in there. So what else? I want you know, I want to mention something else you know this is the be here now network and i can't imagine this but i'm i'm just going to you know take a shot and imagine that some of you don't know that krishna das has a podcast on the be here now network okay maybe maybe not but even if you do know i'm urging you to go check out his podcast. Let's go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and just look for Krishna Das. You'll find him. And, I mean, like he just did a, 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 a podcast that was all around practice and all the different kinds of practices and finding the right one that works for us. And here's what he said about it. I just, it's, a, it's a great quote. Eventually, these thoughts of quote-unquote me don't arise anymore. And then you recognize your true nature. Those thoughts are clouds covering the sun. And when they don't arise, the sun shines. It's not like the sun isn't shining all the time. By practicing, these clouds disappear. Which is just essential, practical stuff. And nobody is more practical than he. And honest, uh, so yeah, tune in to Krishna Das. Um, okay, that's all of my advertisements for today. Of course, 1440, uh, 1440 Multiversity. We do a lot of great, great work with them. And uh, they also have uh, just uh, a host of uh, wonderful teachers out in uh, Santa Cruz. Go to 1440.org and check them out. I got it all in. Good. Okay, uh, now here now for some hyperbole, which is this talk from Ramdas, because the hyperbole is I think I go on and on all the time, saying this talk I can't imagine. I've been listening to Ramdas for four thousand years, and now here's a talk that I actually wow I never heard him say this or. Wow, he's saying this in a completely different way. I'm still getting turned on and finding things out, you know, even after all these years. This is the BS that I go into on a on a podcast to podcast basis. Every time I introduce, it's true, but then the rest of the hyperbole is, you know, the BS part. 
Uh, this one, I'm telling you the truth. I never heard Ram Dass ever talk about this subject, ever, okay? This is like Nathan, he went in there and he found this, who curates all the Ram Dass talks. Okay, it's called Changing Cultural Myths. We are a culture that is living with dysfunctional myths. Boy, they're way more dysfunctional now, seemingly. Uh, he said, back then, this is from 1993, by the way. He said, Transform it, we're in a transformation period. It's been going on, I guess, you know, it's for 25 years now. Developing new stories to give us functional meaning to our existence. I don't know if any of you, um, Bill Moyers, of course, had that great series uh, around myth, and Ram Dass mentions it here, too. Um, so here's some of the, I mean, so he goes into this long list of the different kinds of myths that we are entrapped by and the ones that maybe we can move and transform the myth into a, a more, giving a, a functional meaning to our existence. Um, the first one of those would be, he has one, voluntary simplicity as a winning strategy <laughs> instead of, uh, you know, the, um, the way in which we are, more is better. Material acquisition brings happiness myth. The humans over nature myth. Let's destroy the rainforest so we can get our oil out and make a lot of money. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's our first uh, transforming myth uh, is voluntary simplicity. Uh, what else? He says, science and technology. So this is interesting. Science and technology, right? We've done it. We are conquering the world, but we are not wise enough to anticipate the implications of our act. Science and its products must be tempered with wisdom. Look what's going on today with the internet, right? And this whole thing with social media is really what I'm talking about. And uh, not wise enough to anticipate the implications of our act. So, boy, that's coming to roost right now, this myth. I mean, of course, the, the basic myth that... Uh, Without wisdom, science and technology can be, of course, can look us in the face in a way that's a little bit dark. Uh, but uh, user, let's see. Rational mind, here's another myth. Rational mind is more user-friendly than intuitive heart mind. Right? That's a myth. Uh, let's see. Well, how about the myth of our patriarchal society? Okay, we're awakening uh, from buying into that myth, right? That awakening, well, that awakening did start a long time ago. But how about the Me Too movement now in terms of predicting the uh, giant awakening that's going on now? That's another myth. He has so many great myths here. I, this talk, I, I really, I mean, I've told the people at the, the foundation, we got to make a big deal about this and make sure more people know about this. This is just a fantastic talk. Myth of monogamy, you know, serial monogamy. Is it a failure of the culture or is it a new mythology? <laughs> but here's the biggie, the biggie, biggie, the myth of individualism. I mean, um, Gee, uh, something else I should have said in the in the beginning around talking about ads and things we want to announce. We have a wonderful new coll collaboration with uh, a music artist named East Forest, who went over and had uh, these wonderful talks with Ram Dass and asked him a bunch of different questions and came up with these great words of wisdom, which he then mixed into this fantastic. Uh, these fantastic song sound beds. It's just uh, really substantial music. And uh, again, more hyperbole, but uh, go to uh, ramdas.org and uh, I'm sure it'll be in the, in the header there. You can get a link and get linked up to the music. 
Also, put your email in there because we're sending an email out and giving the links to free listen to it. Uh, it's, it's a great video as well. But the reason I thought of this is the myth of individualism. Because in this this first um, the first song that has a video to it is called Mind Karma. And in it, he talks about the reality of what individualism does. And it just made me think of what he said here, uh, which was, in the 60s, I was part of the perpetuation of individualism. And I'm thinking, you know, I... I did a podcast on mind rolling, right? That's also on Be Here Now Network. For those of you who haven't run over there and taken a listen, uh, m- and we did a thing called Hippie Trail, and it, it was about uh, seekers and smugglers and people who went to the East. People like me, I had the good karma to actually follow Ramdas over there and meet Maharaji, as many other I have friends who eventually became, like in this particular friend, uh, Jadu Daner, he did all these smuggles. And so we talked a lot about that and what the hippie credo was. And, there, and, and I, my main thing in this whole thing was like, what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding? That credo from the hippie era, we need that now, don't we? And um, so suddenly, but through the whole talk that I had with uh, Jadu, there was always this that we did talk about what, you know, why is it that so much of that credo and the philosophy of the year and the lifestyle has just been put down? You know, hippie's like a a derogatory word now. Well, you're going to, you work like a hippie, huh? It's, uh, so we talked about that. And now I listen to this talk and Ramdas exactly explains what it was that we collectively were doing. He says, me, Right, I was part of the perpetuation of individualism. Why? Because the experience of psychedelics was a personal experience. From that experience, we created communities, communes, but they were naively constructed. They were made up of individualism, individuals who had not purified the me-me out of them. So when they weren't high on dope, he says, they went back into their individualism because the myth was so strong. I just found that fantastic. Really, that is what happened. That's why today I do believe Next Gen, everybody, they're they're doing it. They want to share. They want to collectively be in the experience of making change happen for positivity in everyone's lives. And we were so far into, you know, a bit of expression of up your ass, but uh, the psychedelics, uh, the naivete really was so overwhelming and so connected to that myth that we, you know, we just, the, the myth of individualism. So just fantastic here. He also says the 60s naivete created the right and fundamentalism. Yo, God. Whoa. All right, well, enough. We want to listen to the talk. Uh, here it is. I'm Ramdas, here and now, changing cultural myths. We'll see you next week. Now, the list that I haven't used yet, which I'm just going to run through, is the way in which our society at this moment is, I'd say, between storylines. That we are a culture that is living with basically dysfunctional myths. And that we're in a transformation period in which we are feeling our way into new mythic identities, new stories to justify or to give us a meaning, a functional meaning to our existence. And just to give you 
Here's a list of things that are in transition to give you a feeling, because you'll recognize every one of them. You don't often see them as a list. You recognize all of them. They'll give you a feeling of how much we are in transition. Okay, here are some of the ones. I'll just, I won't go into them because each one could be gone into deeply and each one isn't as simplistic as I'm presenting it, but you'll hear it. In our current myths, or the myths we've held, we've had the myth that each generation would be better off economically than the generation previous to it. That is no longer a functional myth in our society. It is not true. It is not true. The past generation is the first generation in which that didn't happen. We have a myth that we are a youthful culture. The baby boomers, which is the thrust of the population, will be 50 in 1996. Be beginning to be 50. We are an aging culture. We don't have a mythology for being aging. We have only a mythology for being young. When you have a young culture, you treat aging as failure, as impotence, as ineffectiveness. And because you want them just the way we do with death, you want them out of the picture so they won't undermine your confidence in winning since in time there are no winners and they are reminders of it we divide generationally and we create nice spaces for generations to go to to be out of the mainstream of our consciousness we have a myth that humans are the stewards and the controllers of nature that it is human over nature That is a dysfunctional myth. And we are being faced with the devastation that that myth has allowed us to create. And the, we can feel the inertia in the shift to the myth that we are part of a biotic community or at the more mystical level that we are a part of Gaia or earth consciousness and are only a part and that we offer our prefrontal lobes we don't even have the choice to offer them they are in the service of they are but cells in a larger game we have as a myth the one I've been talking about that material acquisition brings happiness it's very simply more is better and the, the iconography, the temples, the iconography, the icon of our age is the automobile. The temples are the shopping malls. And if you go to the shopping malls, you see people going through in prayerful, uh, prayerful reverence. For, and you can feel the arid spiritual quality and yet the deep investment in this as a, as a temple, as a religious institution. And we are a long way from moving fully into a myth in which voluntary simplicity is understood as a winning strategy, in which less becomes better. That's a real reversal. We are still functioning under a mythic model that unalloyed, unadulterated technology is good. That science and its stepchild technology can produce only better living for everybody through chemistry. Now, it has given us incredible changes in our life quality, in the way we live our lives. And it would be naive not to see that. But the idea that it's an unadulterated good. For example, each thing that comes along, like when the automobile came along, there was no body of us in the society 
that was a wisdom carrier that sat and reflected about the implications of this technology in terms of the greater good of all beings. And when you look at the way, for example, the fact that in cities, over a third, sometimes as much as a half of the entire space of the city is designated for automobiles. And now when we find a moment when a road is closed off for humans, how thrilled we are. How thrilled we are. Like Central Park on weekends in New York. Or malls that you drive through during the week and then they're closed on the weekend. And certainly in dealing with nuclear proliferation, I mean, I was one of the people when we split the atom and the implications of it for energy to take away poverty and to provide a standard of living for everyone. I was part of the people that would say, wow, we've done it. Our minds through science and technology have indeed, we are conquering the world because we weren't wise enough to anticipate the implications of our acts. And we are approaching a wisdom base in which we understand that science and its products must be tempered with wisdom, that it is not a substitute for wisdom. Because when I was a professor at Harvard, science was the, was the ultimate priesthood of our society. Those were the priests, the high priests. We are functioning still under the myth that the rational mind is more user-friendly than the intuitive heart-mind. Again, when I was at Harvard, the intuitive, the word intuition, was seen as a weak and soft concept. If you can't think, you intuit. And over time, we have come to see that we have impoverished ourselves. And if you look at it from the point of view of evolution, you see that we went in our evolutionary arriving at Homo sapien, we went from prehensile capacity, which gave us incredible power over beings that didn't have that. And then we developed these prefrontal lobes that had the capacity to remember and plan and organize and analyze and conceptualize. And that is a great siddhi or power. And when I said the other day that Maharaji said, siddhis are pig shit, take it at the deepest level that the, we got so enamored of the power of our analytic mind, because look, we can go to the moon with it. It looks like we can win with it. That's the thing about a power. It sucks you in to thinking you can do good as much as you want. But now we see that the use of the analytic mind is divisive also, because it identifies you with thought and thought is about an object, and you end up always being one thought away from where the action is or where the wisdom truly lies. Because to be wise, you must be part of everything from inside, not to know it from outside. And the distinction between knowledge and wisdom is the shift from one of these myths to another. Everybody still here? Is it still yeah. here? Okay. We have functioned under the myth of the separation of church and state, which has become misinterpreted as the separation of spirit and state. And we are just now recognizing, and what is exciting about this moment is the possibility that we can once again regain the understanding that spirit can imbue state the political machine. Because most of us in the spirit have treated the political stuff as, in a way, the no-no of where 
decent human beings spend their time. I mean, these shifts in myths, many of you remember, I don't know about you, but I grew up going between, uh, in baby, in care of babies, between schedule feeding and demand feeding. I mean, my mother, in order to be a good mother, in her Martinet role, you know, it is not six o'clock. You'll just have to wait. And now, for most parents, that concept seems so insensitive. And we go from, I mean, I grew up, children are seen but not heard. That was what I was told again and again. If you want to be with the adults, you be quiet. You wash and you dress properly, and then you can sit with us if you're quiet. I mean, I lived with myths I can't believe any longer uh, that existed. When I look now at my friend's children, I can't get a word in edgewise any longer in a, in a house. And I hate it and love it at the same moment. I mean, I can feel, and I'm sure the parents do too. It's a shifting mythology. Look at the one about diet. I can remember my mother saying, if you don't finish your meatloaf, you can't have your chocolate cake. <laughs> she was a good mother. She really cared about me. Eat your white bread. <laughs> you know? The only one I caught her with was junket. She'd say, eat your junket. I'd say, you eat it first. <laughs> Took years to find out she hated junket. How about the myth? How about the myth, be fruitful and multiply? We have at the moment five and a half billion people on the surface of the earth. In 40 years, because of the asymptotic curve, we will have another five and a half billion people. We will double our population in the next 40 years. So, if you think living conditions are interesting now, just wait. We are, we are just at the top of the iceberg of appreciating what violence has been done through sexual oppression in our society, through the myths of a patriarchal vertical society. It is so imbued in our religions, in our social institutions, that you can feel the cry and the wail of pain in women who are just awakening from having bought into the myth. And this is just the edge of the process. And in the, you can feel how, what happens when a new myth comes in, how the first stages are the pushing against the old myth, in which one's defined by against and by outrage and anger. And then only later does the fullness of the what the new myth is emerge so that women and men can find their their true equality not equality in action but equality in respect and dignity and appreciation for the way the dance dances around the poles of male and female we have a long way to go. The myth that the mind and the body are two separate things is giving way. I mean, Bill Moyers is carrying the flag, among others. <laughs> but I mean, it is an emerging understanding that holistic health has been working with for some time. I mean, here's where you see what we call new age mainstreaming you begin to see something that ancients have known all along, that all of Chinese medicine, all of 
all of Ayurvedic medicine, all of these have recognized the intimacy between somatogenic and psychogenic in terms of the cause of, of any kind of pathology of mind or body. And in relation to health, we are moving from focus on symptom to focus on prophylactic or healthy prevention of pathology. That's a big shift in the medical model, in the model of healing in our society. And you can watch how it came in at the extreme, pushed away, outlawed, and then forced itself in because it had a ring of truth in it. And often it oversells itself, and that creates more doubt, and then you, gotta, you have that issue. And then who licensed and who's legitimate? And you just watch when myths change, you know. I mean, I went through my lifetime from when you had something with your back, you went to an orthopedic surgeon. Then they allowed these things called osteopaths. They were medically trained, but they were people who could manipulate the spine. Chiropractors was a dirty word. Somebody say, did you, you went to a chiropractor? <laughs> now, chiropractors are so legitimate that people that do massage with manipulation are now, it's the same way, is this too much? Huh? Because I'm just playing with this stuff, but I don't want to overload you. It's quite a list, isn't it? I mean, I went, when, here's, here's a good one. When I was teaching at Harvard, if a student wanted to take a semester off, they had to get a psychiat psychiatrist letter, okay, saying that they were mentally unbalanced and needed that period and would pursue a course of therapy. Look at what has happened in these years about the understanding of education. Look at that, that took my lifetime. You know, I sat with my father, he was dying in this body, I was taking care of 89 years old, 90 years, he bought it, born in 1898, and I thought in his one lifetime, the airplane, the telephone, the automobile, you know, on and on and on and on, what transformations in one human life. When I was, went to Harvard, the only people that could do therapy were psychiatrists. I was a psychologist and I demanded that I have a therapeutic appointment along with my academic appointment. And the psychiatrist wouldn't even talk to me because I was not a psychiatrist. I was not medically trained. Even though I had a PhD in psychology, when they found out I had been analyzed by a Freudian, they <laughs> relented. They relented and let me see real people because psychologists with PhDs in those days were allowed to do Rorschach testing. Now look what's happened in 30 years. Then PhDs in psychology were finally allowed in as therapists. Then what happened? Then social workers? On and on and on and on. The whole system just kept opening up. Transformation in 30 years. The myth of competition, that the best is brought out in everybody through competition. And the free market economy is still rooted in that assumption, which is an assumption that is basically in the long run dysfunctional, as opposed to collaboration. There's some balance in that whole process of competition and collaboration, and we sure as hell haven't found it yet. In education, the focus was, the myth is in, that education is that a child is a container and you fill it with facts, and then it knows things, and then it is educated. Very, very slowly, we are shifting to an understanding that education has to be about how to learn, not what to learn. It has to be about how to access information, not how to know information. It has to honor wisdom as well as knowledge. 
and you begin to see just the leading edges of that in education in the Steiner schools, in the Montessori schools, in the Quaker schools, in experimental universities, in just the loosening of the curriculum of places like Hampshire College and all these wonderful places. The myth that you made a decision around 18 about your career and that's what you did for your lifetime. And if you changed along the way, you were seen as, as Bill Clinton is often accused of, as being a waffling type person. How irresponsible to change. When I was 11 years old, I said I wanted to be a doctor. Immediately I was given a microscope, a big painting of the first operation for my bedroom wall. Uh, I mean, I was like geared in, Jewish family, doctor, yeah, baby, oh, he's going to be a doctor. My child is going to be a doctor. Isn't that wonderful? Here's how far it got. It got so that when I, so I went through college taking comparative anatomy and cytology and histology and embryology and all that kind of wonderful stuff, practically flunking all of them like C, B minus, you know, that's the kind of a student I was. Everything in psychology I got A's in. So it looked like the handwriting was on the wall, but the myth was so strong. My father had, mother had bought into it so deeply. My father was quite a power player. He was the president of, uh, he was the head of the board of trustees and the founding father of Brandeis University. And I was at Tufts. And Leonard Carmichael was the president of Tufts. Leonard was a psychologist, but he was also a politician. So my father called him, because I had been turned down at that point by every medical school I had applied to, <laughs> and they were being very reasonable. <laughs> Leonard, this is George. I've got this kid. He hasn't shown much promise yet, but I know he'll be a damn good doctor. Leonard, answer. George, I keep a few spaces at the medical school. I'll take care of it. Thanks, Leonard. Get a message. The president wants to see you. So I go in and he says, I understand you're going to medical school. I said, well, actually, I don't think it's appropriate. I'm thinking of becoming a psychologist. He's, he's a psychologist. You're gonna... He says, that's absurd. You'd be a terrible psychologist. Go to medical school. I said, well, I can't get into medical school. He said, we'll take care of that. And he picked up the phone in front of me and he called the dean. He says, uh, this is Leonard Carmichael. Uh, young Alpert, you have his application. I want him in the, in the first class. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're in medical school. Enough of this. And something in me that is either saved or destroyed me, depending on how you look at it all through life, or it depends on who's doing the assessing, said, I wouldn't go to medical school now, Dr. Carmichael, if you paid me. And he said, you're making a terrible mistake. And so just to, to finish the humor of the story, I went on to graduate school at Wesleyan, which is the only place that would take me. And then from there, I was shuffled to Stanford, and then from Stanford, I was invited back to Harvard, which I had never gotten into as a student to be on the faculty. And at the first commencement in cap and gown, my parents came and I was walking down. Jack Kennedy was the speaker. He was the senator. And I said to the folks, well, is this enough? And my father said, but how much are you going to make? Do you see the changing myths? I mean, I'm just playing with putting like a little flesh on some of these bones because you can put it on all of them. But where you picked a career at 18 and you were expected, to, or 12 in my case, and that was it for a lifetime, and how now, just because of the economic mobility and the mobility of the culture and all, it is expected that every person will change careers at least five times in the course of their life. And if you have a myth that changing career is a failure, 
and yet you have an economic reality that is going to happen, look at what happens when worlds collide. We have a myth about Syria, about, we have a myth about monogamy. But in California, the fact of the matter is, it is serial monogamy. You are married to one person at a time, but maybe more than one in a lifetime. Now, do we interpret that as the failure of the culture, or do we interpret it as a new mythology? Do we say that the system fell down of the single family unit? You know, I'm caught in the bind in this, I mean, emotionally, intuitively, and I'll just share it with you, that I grew up in a pressure cooker with the shared psychosis of my father and mother being the total influence on me for about 16 years. Many of my friends have gotten divorced that had children, and each of the partners has remarried. And I've watched those children who I had the model, poor kids, they're being torn between, grow up now in two households with four parents. You know, it took me about 20 years before I could accept that I was jealous of those kids. That's a hard one, because you can feel in yourself the caughtness in the different myths. And I'm not saying this is good, I'm just saying it's what is at the moment. Just acknowledge where the myths and the storylines go. Maybe the storyline is this is the failure and we must go back or reestablish or re Because one of the failures, one of the other ones on this list is we got so addicted to the myth of individualism. What's in it for me? Am I going and pushing away family, extended family, till there wasn't a babysitter around? There are no aunts and people that are part of the whole thing. The child isn't being brought up in this rich extended family. It's being brought up in an apartment with two people who are locked in in this thing, feeling trapped. And you go, I go to Guatemala, I go to Mexico, I go to India. Uh, all the places I go to, which are societies that haven't yet gotten to our level of sophistication, and you can feel the richness of the web in which people are part of social communal structures in which their basic identity is part of that. They're not an individual who's deciding to be part of a community. That's the way back. They just define themselves as part of a community. Their definition of themselves is as much role as personality. That may be too short-circuited, but if you understand that. You and I have grown up in such a personality cult, such an addiction to what do I need, what do I want, who am I as a personality, to escape from that constellation of reality into the fact that basically I'm part of a biotic community, I'm part of a social structure, a political structure, a family structure. These are networks that define my identity equally as important as me as a separate entity. And I, in the 60s, was part of the perpetuation of individualism. Because what happened was the, the experience of psychedelics was a personal experience. And while we had the summer of love and these communities, they were so naively constructed with such idealism that most of them, I mean, Lama is the exception to the rule, most of them dissolved because they were made up of individuals who hadn't yet purified, and when they weren't high on dope, they went back into their individualism because the myth was so strong. And so it turned from a summer of love to the, the worst part of the new age of who's ripping off whom. This is harsh, but I mean, this is, I'm nearly done. I can go on and on, but. We are in the midst of a transformation from the myth that war is a solution in war is a solution to understanding that diplomacy is the only solution. The nuclear bomb helped a great deal with that because we began to see the absurdity that you could only go so far and you couldn't you had to stop or you did yourself in. And that was an incredible forcing of the political consciousness about the nature of relationships among human beings. And we're still we haven't learned it yet. We're just learning it. We're learning it. And that if anybody loses, nobody wins. That's another myth. 
We are so, if you watch, you look at the American consciousness on weekends glued to the television set about winning and somebody loses and somebody wins and it's all good sport and good fun. But look at the cost to all of us in the understanding that we have invested so much in the game of winning. And we don't even, when Stu Brand and people like that came out with games in which everybody won, everybody said, but where's the juice in them? The win-win game where everybody wins. I mean, I watched, I had a brother, an older brother who was a sportsman, very competitive. And I go out, I really wanted to enjoy tennis. But he turned it into something always that made me suddenly uh, feel the depth of my inadequacy. There's a beautiful story, of, I wonder if I can remember it, about two kids playing with a shuttlecock, with that thing with rackets and a thing that... And one kid was beating the other kid badly, and the other kid said, I'm not going to play anymore. And the kid that was winning, this is the shift right here, he said, well, let's change the game to see how long we can keep it in the air together. Feel that transition? Right there is that one. You can afford competition when you are truly rooted in collaboration. And the essence of good sportsmanship is those two planes of consciousness, not one or the other, by the way. But we've sort of lost that a little bit. We've lived under the myth that Columbus discovered America. <laughs> it allowed us to practice genocide. We have not yet apologized for what we have done. We have not yet acknowledged our own guilt. This is a major change in mythology, and the fifth 500th anniversary was a brilliant moment when the attempt to perpetuate the myth was met head on by the reality of what happened. And if you want to talk about karma, the way karma affects life, you will see that our identity as people we would like to be in terms of moral, compassionate society, until we have come to terms with that root situation in our culture, there isn't a chance of a snowball in hell that we can be what we truly can be. The idea, continuing that, that we do not, that we are a moral nation. The Vietnam War was the direct confrontation with that issue. And the awakening of the human heart that said, this isn't good, in the anti-Vietnam War movement, was part of the shift, because we had gone in a GNP trajectory, trajectory where we could fight a war solely on economic grounds not on human grounds. And our human spirit rose up in agony and said, it's not good enough, everybody. And we are in a predicament where we are trying to shift. We aren't doing very well, as the Gulf War showed, and the hundreds of thousands of Iraqi dead for Storm and Norman. To admit our fallibility, what a hard part of a myth that we don't have, to say we were wrong. Look at the myth that our leader is to be decisive and always know what's right. Look at what's happening as Bill Clinton says, well, you know, I don't really know. This is a really complicated issue. President cops out. President waffling. Serious concerns about leadership ability. What did we want? You remember when Gandhi... The Congress party came and said, the British are insufferable, we've got to get rid of them. And Gandhi said, I'll meditate on it, because he was the spiritual head of the party. And they came back a week later and they included, you know, Byrd and Robert Dole and all the mishpacha, and they came and they said, well, what do we do now? And he said, I'm still meditating. Can you imagine that, to tell that to senators and congressmen? Two months until they finally said, I think he's lost it, you know, I think we better go ahead, we can't wait for him. And then he said, 
it's clear, and he picked up his staff and he started walking and he walked for 11 days and thousands of people started to follow him and he went to the ocean and he bathed and then he came up on the beach, as you all know, and he reached down and he picked up a handful of salt, which was an act of defiance against the British government who had created a law that all salt had to be bought through British-controlled companies, even though it was readily available. It was illegal for an Indian to mine his own salt, and for a poor family that took almost a quarter of their income just for the salt they needed to survive in a semi-tropical culture. And within a month of his reaching down, 70,000 people were in prison for mining their own salt. And while that wasn't, it was a complex situation of many forces, one man reaching down and picking up a handful of salt so resonated in the hearts of human beings that it, was, it broke the back of the most powerful empire on earth. I mean, you could almost take it to that simplistic level of like the power of love over fear, the thing we were talking about last night. This is in our country so that now the upper 1% controls over 40% of the gross wealth. This curve is so skewed, and we now have, in the past 12 years, created a permanent underclass because of the myth which said, when rich people get more, it will trickle down out of their compassion. Except that was based on an assumption that compassion was more powerful than greed. And the fact of the matter is, is that greed is more powerful than compassion when you have a basically unstable situation because instability creates fear and fear leads to gathering and collecting and greed. It was just a misassumption about who we are. That was it. Trickle-down theory had a nice compassion idea in mind, it just didn't work because it was based on the wrong assumption about who we are. We're coming out of the mythic structure that says birth and death are something that are basically embarrassing and should be kept out of the way, and the death is an error. We are just beginning to consider the possibility that death is part of the game of life. We don't even know how to deal with it yet. We're just playing at the edge of it. We're going from the intensive care ward to the hospice to the home to the spiritual ashram for dying. That's the progression we're in. And we're still too far back to support the ashram fully. We've gotten to the hospice, which is the psychological support, but not the spiritual awareness that what's dying anyway? As somebody that is bisexual, I will tell you that I spent the first 40 years of my life in the closet in terms of my, the part of me that was homosexual. And I treated it as pathology. And I felt like I was a reject in the culture. And it was nothing I had anything to do with creating, and there was nothing I could do about it. I did everything. I went into psychoanalysis. I went through all the processes I could go through to change that, and I couldn't change it. And as far as I was concerned, I was damned. And by the time it started to come out of the closet that it was all right to be gay, even a little bit, in a way it was too late in my life. The myth was too strong in me. The ability to be gay and be free and feel that I was a healthy part of a system. The gay community has often asked me to speak on their behalf, and I do, and I speak, I work with AIDS community, and I do what I can, but I can't make it my cause because the deep inner mythology in me is just so deep in that I am basically, that God made it so that men and women should be together and anything else is aberrant and pathological. And that is, I hope to God, a shifting myth, in spite of the Bible in spite of the Bible. And finally, there was the, and I can go on and on, but there was the myth that the religious institutions of our society would provide the ethical, moral base of the society. And I do not find in Pat Robertson or Jerry Falwell 
or our leading TV and evangelists. There's just this great story I can't resist telling you, many of you know it, of my friend Milton Friedman. <laughs> Milton Friedman, there's a Dr. Milton Friedman who's my friend. There's another Dr. Milton Friedman who's an economist that you've mostly heard about, a very famous economist in Washington. My friend was a speechwriter in the Ford White House. One day he received a telephone call. Is this Dr. Milton Friedman? Yes. I represent a church in California. We have quite an excess of funds, and we wondered if you would give us advice as to how to invest them. My friend Milton Friedman said, have you considered giving them to the poor? That was silence. And the man on the line said, is this the real Milton Friedman? <laughs> to which my friend answered, is this the real church? <laughs> I would say to you, People say to me, why is it you say that the 90s are more exciting than the 60s? And I say, because in the 60s, we were naive. In the 90s, the whole thing is opening up all over again. But this time we realize, in the 60s, we thought that if we did it, everybody would follow. And our naivete basically created the right. It basically created fundamentalism. It created it because we represented the potential of chaos and anarchy in the society. Because we, through the inner experiences we had through many, many causes, drugs, the information age, mobility, all of the things that change the system, whatever, and then carried by the minstrels, the rock and roll music, into all the consciousnesses of billions of people, literally. We represented something that undercut the patriarchal, patriarchal vertical structures. We were the crowd that held hands around the Pentagon and ohmed so it would rise. And while only a few people actually saw it rise, the <laughs> still, just the symbolism of seeing the Pentagon as a paper tiger was the undercutting of the social institution. And that allowed, at some level, and this is certainly not, drugs were only one of the catalysts. There were, it was all over determined. It was determined by the affluence from the 50s that allowed for space for people not to just spend all their time surviving. Whatever it was, it was the civil rights movement. It was the sexual freedom movement. It was the gay movement. It was the anti-Vietnam movement. On and on and on and on. It was the breakdown of the existing social structures. And the society freaked because the people that didn't taste that didn't come along. They went like that because their IRAs were in jeopardy. And they created a structure to control this, and they did. I mean, that, that cross-dresser in the FBI led the charge. I mean, that's how bizarre the whole thing was. That's how bizarre... That's the black humor of history, I'll tell you. The black humor of history. And this time around, it's different. And I tell you, this time around, if everybody doesn't go, nobody goes. And there is the recognition now, because the environmental imminence is breathing down our necks one way, the economic instability of the disparity is breathing down our necks another way. The forces that force change are so upon us that that resistance to hold on to the king of the mountain, and it is king, not queen, thus far, historically, to hold on to that will take everything down with it rather than give up. And it's why on my puja table, 
I have a picture of Robert Dole, right? I used to have Casper Weinberger. I've replaced it with Robert Dole. Because until I can see in Robert Dole, Maharaji, my heart isn't ready to be the warrior that is needed at this moment to bring about peace and to bring about healing. So I want to invite you, just, I didn't know that this was going to be the whole thrust of the lecture. I thought I'd run through the list and then get on with the lecture. But I just want to show you what a moment of change and opportunity this is to redefine the game and the potential for a spiritual redefinition of the game, that possibility is real. And in that sense, this kind of a scene is the leading edge of the possibility of what we are about. It was in the 60s and then it went underground and the people that were doing it either went off secretly to study, took it inside their homes, or else said, well, I'll use my new consciousness to rip off the system. What the hell? I'll get what I can because of individualism. But I invite you to examine the disparity between your understanding of the potential of the new myths and your, the way your life is expressing itself and how much your life is in harmony with your own values. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.